I really desire for you to grow as an individual. In fact, the first scripture in, in 2 Peter 3 verse 18, it says, Now grow in grace and in the knowledge of Him. Amen? Uh, the Bible says of Jesus that Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and with man. And so the, the, the idea that Jesus had to grow, it means that we have to grow. I know there's some strange uh, ideas or teachings that says Jesus came out of the womb and he was talking already. Anybody heard that? So he spoke as a baby. I'm like, okay, that's not in the scripture. I think it's some other books or some other ideas. But that's not the reality. Jesus was born as a baby. Like any one of us, one of us are born as babies. And he went through this growth process and, and growing to become all that God designed for him to be. And so I'm saying that because you and I need to realize that in our lives, we have to grow. And sometimes we, especially as younger people, we're not where we want to be. And we feel like, oh, how come he's so far ahead? Or how come she is getting those results? And we sometimes compare ourselves and feel like we're not there. But the reality is that we grow to become the people that we can be. Right? Nobody is born as a baby with all their potential, all their uh, destiny fulfilled. We all have this process of growth. Can we agree on that? So sometimes when you look at your life and you feel like, okay, I'm not where I want to be or I'm not as talented as, an, as a musician or a singer or a preacher as I want to be, then realize that you can grow. Amen? Tell your neighbor next to you, you can grow. You can grow. You can get better. And tell them you will grow this year. <laughs> Amen. And I'm looking forward to it. So as I engage with you and I talk to you, I want you to realize that where you are now is not where you're going to be in this year. You're growing. Amen? So we're going to grow stronger. We're going to grow healthier. We're going to grow bigger. We're going to grow wiser. We're going to grow financially. We're going to grow in our relationships, in love, in wisdom, and stature. And that's my prayer and desire for you. So everything that we do as a church, our messages, our preaching, Cecilia and I have been talking, how do we grow? How do we grow? How do we grow? Amen. Anybody else want to grow? Just want to make sure I'm in the right place. All right. There we go. Thank you. All right. So we talk about growth. Now, there was one message I was preparing, which was about seven ways that you can grow uh, in your faith and grow spiritually. But I thought, ah, you know what? That may be a little bit boring this morning. So let me try and take a different route. And this week, I was spending time in the Word and just thinking about things. And this idea that I'm going to share with you today dropped into my heart for me to share with you. And I was thinking of a way to make it exciting and to make you more intrigued without making it like an intellectual uh, university lecture. I wanted it to be exciting. So, so this book phrase that I came up with is, I'm going to give you the secret. You like secrets, eh? You know, as soon as someone says, can I tell you a secret? Like you can be fast asleep, you can be, you know, dozing off. As soon as somebody says, let me tell you a secret, you're like, what? Yeah, let's hear. Anybody else? We love stories. Let's be, come on, be real with me now. Right? We love secrets. So I thought, okay, let me give you a secret. And this secret is the secret to 100% answered prayer. Right? 100% answered prayer. Now, if we're going to grow, Levi's, you like that idea? Right? If we're going to grow, in our lives, then God has to answer our prayers. Because we will find that we cannot do everything on our own ability. And the problem is that sometimes we limit ourselves to our own ability. And when we don't pray, and when we don't trust God, when we don't seek God, then we are indirectly saying to God, I got this. Okay? If we don't pray, I mean, if I don't pray as a preacher, then I'm indirectly saying, I can do this on my own. I can use my talents and abilities to lead. If we don't pray for our businesses, we're saying, okay, God, I got this. I got the business ideas. I got the degrees. I don't need your help. But every time we pray, we are confessing our dependence on Him. And so I want to talk about this idea of 100% answered prayer. And as a focus, I've been looking at the life of Jesus. And as we said last week, is that whenever we think about our lives and where we want to go, we must keep Christ at the center. Not Netflix series, not TikTok one-minute videos or YouTube. No, we have to keep Christ at the center. And so, 
in my in my reading of the gospels we have started with Luke in December and into John I I came across this idea of what made Jesus what motivated Jesus to do what he did because in scripture it's only Jesus who had 100% answered prayer it's only Jesus who got it right all the time everybody else made mistakes along the way right and of course you and I will make mistakes along the way but our desire and our focus is to become like Jesus that's what he called us to as a young person as some of you sitting here you all might ask yourself what is my destiny what is my purpose what am i doing on earth many of us have those kind of questions and we use that question to just decide what career path we're going to choose or what uh, we want to study and so forth but the the bible says in romans chapter 8 that god predestined us meaning that he gave us a destiny predestined gave us a destiny and this destiny it says was to look like Jesus. The Bible says he, he predestined us to be conformed into the image of his son. So whether we become school teachers, musicians, doctors, lawyers, whatever we decide we're going to do or become, God wants us in that environment, in that position to represent Jesus. And for those of you that may not know, Jesus was a carpenter at one point in his life. And so you can imagine there the son of God doing a menial job of carpentry polishing sand papering you know fulfilling the duties of a carpenter and he was still the Christ you know being a carpenter didn't make him less of uh, of of god didn't make him less of the son of god so likewise in our everyday life in every situation god has called us to be like jesus as husbands as fathers as mothers our destiny is to be like jesus and everything else becomes the details of what we do along the way. Amen. So in looking at the life of Jesus, I stumbled across this idea and and I'm it's not new to you. You might say I've heard this before, it's no secret, but I can promise you if you grab a hold of it, it will change your life this morning because it literally changed my perspective, changed my idea and my philosophy for life. Whereas making tea became a joy yesterday. <laughs> All right. So let's go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 The Gospel of John chapter 14 And we're going to read from verse 12 John chapter 14 verse 12 to 14 Please of course if your if your Bible has the words of Jesus in red you will notice red letters It means Jesus is speaking, and we should do well to pay attention to that. John fourteen, verse twelve to fourteen. I'm reading from the NIV. He says, "Very truly, very truly." In other words, he's saying what I'm about to say. Verily, verily means I'm guaranteeing the statement. There's no misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm saying a matter of fact. He says, "Verily, verily, I tell you." Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Verse 13. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14. You may ask me anything and I will do it. You will ask me anything and I will do it. Now, these three verses are loaded with so much content and information that I'm going to try just to simplify and extract just the basic points of how do we get him to answer our prayers or in fact how do we cooperate with him that our prayers get answered. So in verse 12, he says that those who believe in me will do greater works. Now, just stop for a moment there. That statement alone is mind blowing. Because Jesus raised the dead, he walked on water, he fed, he multiplied food, he cast out demons, he did all those amazing things. And then he says those who believe in me will do greater. The argument there is that you know, we cannot do greater in terms of I mean raising the dead. I mean, how do you how do you do greater works than raising the dead? So the argument for some people is that we as the church will do greater works uh corporately 
and in terms of number. So greater meaning that Jesus only lived for three years, right? In those three years that he lived, he did so many amounts of miracles and stuff like that. The calling of the church then over the last 2,000 years as his church to continue doing greater work, meaning that those raising the dead, healing the sick should continue to us. And so the church then does greater works in volume and quantity over the years. Amen? If you preach to thousands, we're able to reach more people with the gospel and preach the gospel throughout the world, whereas Jesus only preached the gospel within the particular region of Judea and Jerusalem and so forth. But we have a chance to take it to the ends of the earth. So that's the one idea of this greater works that we are called to do. And we can talk about that later. The thing that he says to his disciples here, in verse 13, he says, I'm going to do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified. And herein lies the secret to 100% answered prayer. It is living for the glory of God. Living for the glory of God. And I want to take a moment and just talk about this idea of glory. Because throughout the scripture, you, if you look at, this, at, at Jesus, he always talks about give God the glory, give God the glory, give God the glory. And we, we sing those songs, but what does it actually mean to give God the glory? What does it actually mean to live for the glory of God? And so I want to just talk about that for a moment. Now, if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. We're going to talk about glory. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Okay, I'm reading from the NIV. Do you have it? He says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable Through the living and enduring Word of God. So in other words, (laughs) for those who do biology, you'll know how babies are born. And he said, you're not born of corruptible seed or perishable seed. You are born of the Word of God. So the Word of God, like I said last week, is a seed. And we are born of that seed. Literally, the translation is there, the spermatozoa of God, for those who follow what I'm saying. So we are born of God's seed and not just human seed. This is what he's saying, our spiritual. Verse 24, he says, Now all people are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. The point I want to make here is that we're talking about living for the glory of God. And I want to point out what Peter says here. He says, all people are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers that fall. The point I want to make here is that every single one of us, as we sit here, has glory. Tell your neighbor you've got some glory. God created us with glory. He created us with glory. In fact, in Psalm 8, it says, What is man that you are so mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? And it says, You have crowned him with glory and honor. So God has crowned each and every one of us with glory. Now, without sounding like an an intellectual scholar, let's just talk about glory for a moment. Glory speaks about all the beauty that somebody has, all their positive attributes, what makes them unique and special. Their, their, their identity, and also the glory speaks of what they have. So people who have lots of money feel like, you know, that's their glory. Like, you know, bank account is fat, driving the latest SUV, and bowling, come through dripping, you know, dragged out with my fags out. I don't know, it's all the latest terms, right? So, so people tend to have their own glory, and when they come into a room or into an environment, they want to flex, and they want to show their glory. You get what I'm saying? And everybody has something unique and special about them. Whether it's their personality, or their humor, or their charm, or their assets, or whatever they have. People have their glory. And the reality is that most people, most of us, we live as human beings 
for our own glory. Meaning that we want to make ourselves better. We want to make ourselves more important. And we want people to recognize us and validate us for the effort that we make. Right? So, you lose a bit of weight. We want somebody to say, hey, I see you lost some weight. We went to board a new dress. We, you know, we're looking nice. We want somebody to say, you're looking nice. Am I being real? Right? After I preach this message, I want you to come and say, Pastor, you did a good job. Don't tell me to see you did a better job. <laughs> I'm just teasing. But you get what I'm saying. All of us, we have glory, we have beauty, we have substance. And we want people to recognize and appreciate us for that. And so we have glory. But the scripture warns us here that that glory is passing and beauty is fading. Even Shakespeare wrote that poem about my fair friend. And he's like, oh, my fair friend, you're so beautiful now, but let me tell you something, your beauty is going to fade. <laughs> you, know that, you know that poem? Did in high school. So, the glory that we have as human beings will fade away. But we have glory. In the same way then, the glory of God speaks about the beauty, the character, the nature, and the substance of who God is, and of course what He has. And throughout the scripture, the Bible says that creation reflects the glory of God. We see the sun, the moon, the stars, the creation, the beauty of the animals, and we realize, wow, man, God is so awesome. Look what he's created. God reveals his glory through what he does. Now, you won't go there. If you're taking notes, you can write down John chapter 2. John chapter 2, you'll know, is the story of Jesus um, turning the water into wine. And I can imagine some people are sitting outside thinking, can Jesus please come and turn water to wine? Can the church please do that? Imagine if we turn water to wine. The church would be packed. There would be no space if we were turning water to wine. <laughs> but I think sometimes we need to turn wine to water. I need that image. <laughs> so it is in John chapter 2, he, he turned water to wine. And in, chapter, sorry, in verse 11, it says, Thus he revealed his glory. And his disciples put their faith in him. So Jesus, when he performed miracles and when he expressed himself and he forgave sin and did healings, he was revealing his glory, the nature and his nature and who he was. So God is going to get some glory. Once again, I'll repeat that Jesus throughout his life then, in revealing that glory, kept pointing people to the Father. For my Father's glory, for my Father's glory. And if you and I are going to experience the same answer to prayers and the same uh, results that God wants us to achieve, then we have to live for His glory. And I want to unpack that idea this morning. Living for the glory of God. Because as much as we want to grow, it mustn't be about our own ambition. It mustn't be about our success or our ego. Remember? In James chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, you don't have to go there, but just remember, the Bible says that you have not because you ask not. And then it says you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss. And asking amiss means that we pray for something that's going to benefit ourselves only. We pray for something that's going to make us look good without glorifying God. So for example, if I say, okay, let's pray for souls to be saved. And then my idea is let me take pictures, put it on Facebook so that I look like I'm so good and so important. Or some people have this idea, you know, God bless me so I can show my enemies that your favor is upon me. Let me tell you something. You know, God loves us and he loves our enemies too. <laughs> right? We might not like our enemies. We might not <laughs> have unforgiveness toward them. But God loves them. Right? So we're going to deal with our beef with them differently. Okay? God's not going to punish them for us. God's not going to hurt them for us. God loves them as well. And that's why Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hurt you. Good do to those that use you. Do good to them. Imagine, we meet some people and we're like, hey man, that person's a user. You heard that? My granny used to like saying it. Oh, that person, they're a user. Anyone heard that term? Make sure I'm on the right one. So and so, they don't want to give anything, but they want to just, they want to use you, use you, use you, use you. Nobody likes those kind of people, right? And then Jesus says, do good to those who despitefully use you. Ah, ay, 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 ay. Anyway, that's Jesus' teaching, not mine. So he's saying be good 
somebody slaps you, turn the other cheek. If someone takes your cloak, give them another one. If they force you to go one mile, go the second. We need to talk, Jesus. <laughs> we need to talk. It doesn't sound like a good gospel. It doesn't sound like what we be preached. But nevertheless, he says this is how we glorify, um, we glorify God. We glorify by doing good to those that we don't like. We'll get to that in the end. So live for God's glory. God's glory then speaks of His goodness, His nature. If we had time, we'd go to Exodus chapter 33, which we won't go there now. But Exodus 33, Moses is talking to God and he says, God, please show me your glory. God, show me your glory. And the Lord responds to Moses and he says, Moses, I can't let you see my face because you see me, you're going to die, right? You can't handle, you're going to OD. Right? You can't, you can't see God and not, and not live. You're going you're gonna to OD. Right? So how a drug, a drug addict would go and take drugs and at some point your body can't handle all the drugs because you're in overdose, right? So God is saying, I'm so good, I'm so awesome, I'm so amazing. If you look at me, you're going to OD and die because I'm just too much for you to handle. Right? And so God says, I'm going to put you in a cliff of the rock and I'm going to pass by you. I'll let you see my back. Okay? I'll let my goodness pass before you. So when Moses says, I want to see your glory, God says, I'm going to show you my goodness. Because the glory of God is the goodness of God. In Romans 3 verse 23, who knows that verse? Romans 3 verse 23, there's a question. Anybody? Romans 3 23. For all have sinned and fell short of the glory. What a fascinating scripture. Because we use that scripture in evangelism, right? For all have sinned. And we put the emphasis on this idea that all have sinned. But what was he saying there? All have sinned and what? Fallen short of the glory. So in other words, God is saying, I want you to walk in the glory. I want you to walk in my goodness, in my love, in my power. I want you to walk there in that. And this is why I don't want you to sin, because sin means you've fallen short of the glory. And Jesus came to restore us to the glory. And so he doesn't want us to sin, because sin is going to keep us from the glory, the goodness, the favor, the love, and all of those things. So the glory of God then, living in that glory, is what he wants us to be, or where he wants us to be. And sin now is keeping us from that glory. That's the gospel, the cross, and so forth. So all have sinned and fall short of the glory. But you and I were created for the glory. And I want you to realize this, that God wants every aspect of your life to reveal his glory. He wants his glory to be seen in every part of your life. There should be no part of your life that doesn't reflect or uh, acknowledge or experience the glory of God. The glory of God is not only for a Sunday morning during worship or for your quiet time. God wants you to live in the glory. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 30. Just in case you think that uh, your church life is separate from your home life, is separate from your work life. See, we have these ideas. That, you know, I can come to church, put my church face on, put my church clothes on, and I can just do church. Those two hours, pastor keeps it short. I like Pastor Oliver, keeps it short, right? And then I can go home and then I can be like, all right, keep my shoe, and I can just be somebody else at home. Then on Monday we go to work, we put our work clothes on, and, and then we're like, okay, and we have a different demeanor at work. But God wants us to be the same person, whether we're at school, whether we're at work or church. As a husband, as a father, you know, we can't, we can't, oh dear, right? I remember we had a teacher at uh, Fairvale, I won't mention his name because, I mean, we're recording. But this, this, this teacher was, he was, a, he was, he was in church, he was saved, everybody knew that he was saved. I don't know if he was a leader in his church, possibly, and everybody knew that. But man, he could swear worse than a sailor. I mean, like you came into the class and he would swear the learners left, right, and center. And I remember once I went there for like a betting, you know. And he'd, he'd, you know, you'd walk in, you have to be serious. Because you know, like, you don't want to step out of line. Then he'll make a joke 
you know he's joking, right? So make a joke. And if you laugh, then you become the victim of the joke. Okay? You get slaughtered. Right? You threw the dust at one man and cut his eye. Right? But this was a sieve. This was supposed to be, when, you know, on Sunday, his hands were raised, worshipping. and you know, you, <laughs> But on Monday, he was swearing us left, right, and center. That's not the way God wants us to live. Right? We need to be the same throughout. So I want to show you 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. You there? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Okay, sorry, verse 31. Verse 31, it says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. What could be more basic than eating and drinking? In eating and drinking, he's saying, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And this idea struck me this week because, I mean, you see that idea of living for God's glory all the time. But we sometimes don't, like, meditate on it and, and say, okay, what does it actually mean in my day to day? So yesterday, after I was preparing this message and meditating on it, I decided I'm going to make some tea. I'm going to make some tea. And I went to make some tea, and as usual, I make some tea for myself, and I offered to see some tea. Now, I must admit that I've made Cecilia tea all the time. But there's sometimes I don't feel like making a tea. Okay? Can I be honest, right? And sometimes I don't want to ask, because I'm making tea, and I'm like, hey, is it, if I offer, she's going to say she wants. I don't want to make for her. You know? Should I just make it without even asking? But like, I'm keeping it real, right? Can you see? Keeping it real. So anyway, made her some tea. Now, she doesn't know the difference. I make the tea the same all the time. So she'll drink it. She doesn't know whether I was cursing while I was making the tea, whether I was praying over it, whether I was poisoning it. <laughs> right? So the action, the action was the same. I made tea. Okay? But there are times when their tea was made grudgingly or of necessity. Okay? And there are times when their tea was made in love and honor. Right? So the action was the same. It's an everyday task. I make tea every, every day. Likewise, Levi, I'm sure Levi got the same thoughts. Whilst Levi's with tea now, and he's like, I'm in the middle of a game. <laughs> then my dad asked me for tea now. Are you serious? So here's the thing. In making that cup of tea, we can make it grudgingly, or we can make that tea for the glory of God. We can make that tea for the glory of God. How will that mean? That will mean that as I'm making the tea, I'm thinking of Ephesians 5 that says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's a big word. And of course, the Bible says you cannot love in word only, but we love in deed and truth. So every time we do something motivated by love, then we are glorifying God in our actions. And I think mothers do it all the time. When you serve mothers serving their children, making food, cleaning the house, going out of their way, you know, all the moms cursing us while they're cleaning, or they're saying, I love my family, I serve. And if you honest with ourselves, there are times we we do this we do the action, but our hearts are in the right place. And so God is calling us in this year to do all things for the glory of God. And so in those moments when we're frustrated and we're bitter and we're angry as, as a teacher, I'm going to have issues with my learners along the way. Am I going to teach them out of love for the glory of God? Or am I going to be like, hey, these bloody rascals? <laughs> Living for God's glory means that we do all things, whether we eat or drink, for the glory of God. Meaning that in January we're having our cabbage because we had nice Christmas meat. And now we're having beans and cabbage in January. Are we just as grateful? Are we just as appreciative? Do we still say the same grace? You know, Christmas time you're like, Woo, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Woo, I've been waiting a long time to see the gammon and the lamb. Or the, right? We are praising God. Now we're baking the cabbage. You're like, hey, Jesus. <laughs> when's payday <laughs> right but doing things for the glory of God means we appreciate the cabbage the peanut butter, the jam, whatever we're eating because we're thanking and we're appreciating God who gives us all things 
And this is what we need to take into the new year. Is that we're living for the glory of God. And not living for our own glory. Right? So we want to grow. We want to develop. We must. We must become all that God may wants us to be. Because it's unfair. Remember the talents? The Bible says that God gave some one talent, two, three talent, five talent. Everybody had some talent. And the way that people glorified God with their talent was to grow and develop it. Alright? So if God has given you a gift of singing, to grow as a singer, to train your voice and to practice and to develop yourself, that's bringing glory to God. Or it should be. Or it can be to bring glory to yourself. So people say practice, they develop their gifts because they want everyone to see how great they are. Same action, isn't it? The action is to become better. But the right action is to become better to honor and glorify God. Not to become better for my own selfish ambition and own glory. And that's what God is calling us to do this year. As we grow, as we develop, it's all for His glory. Amen? And everything can be done and must be done for His glory. Whether we're welding, tie fitting, whatever we're doing for God's glory. Even gaming. Do it for God's glory. The saying goes like this. Who you are is God's gift to you. The talents and abilities is God's gift to you. What you become or do with them is your gift to God. So take what you have, whether it's one talent, three talents, five talents, whatever little that you have, and let it glorify God. Amen? I want to come to a close with just two more verses. You don't have to go there. But in Isaiah chapter 60, in Isaiah chapter 60, Okay, let's let's go there as we close. Isaiah chapter 60. Two more verses and then we're done. Isaiah chapter 60. Once again, a well-known verse, but I want to just tie it to this idea of glory and living for God's glory. Because that is the secret. The secret to success and happiness, fulfillment, joy, productivity, 100% 100% answer in prayer is to live for God's glory. Because as you're praying, ask yourself, how is what I'm praying for going to glorify God? How am what I'm asking for going to benefit others? Because if it's only for ourselves, James says it's a miss. But if, it's, if we understand how it, or what we're asking for benefits others as well, it glorifies God, then we're praying from the right place. And remember, it's not only the action, but the motive behind the action that, that really counts. So as I check to 60, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. That idea of glory, isn't it? So this idea of glory also speaks of God's brilliance and God's light. It says, verse 2, See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people. But the Lord rises upon you and His glory appears over you. This morning when I woke up, I was saying, Lord, the sun is shining so bright. Everybody in Durban could see the sun. But there are some people that are living in dense darkness. They're living in dense darkness and they don't know it. Because they haven't seen the light of the gospel. And so they wake up and they think to themselves, why are people in church? Are you crazy? You could be sleeping in. Why listen to the word? You, that's, they don't see the benefits of the gospel because their eyes are blinded. In fact, the book of Corinthians says that the God of this world has blinded the mind of unbelievers. So those, those who don't, don't see the gospel, don't see its benefits, are blinded and are thus walking in darkness. I remember I had an experience earlier last year. I was shocked talking about this idea of darkness. Um, we were staying over in a place and I got up in the middle of the night and I couldn't find my phone but it was, it was load shedding and I was in a foreign place I didn't know the surrounding but it was pitch black I think they had these blackout curtains I was literally in fact I, have you ever had an experience where you open your eyes but it's so dark you actually, I was actually feeling my eyes to see or my eyes open and for a second, I was like, Lord, have I gone blind? That's how pitch 
black and dark it was. I was like, and I was trying to feel everywhere, and I, it was. And you know what happened? Fear came upon me. It was. I was fearful. I was afraid. I was like, what's going on? Eventually, I thought of going to the toilet. I ended up walking into the lounge. I was totally lost. <laughs> but you can imagine that if you're walking in dense darkness, that you are totally lost. And that is that is most authentic in terms of the drugs, the alcohol, the gangsterism. They are lost. I mean, why would you go and kill people? Why would you be willing to lay down your life unless you cannot see any hope? You cannot see any light that your life will get better. So it's like, well, let's just shoot each other. And so dense darkness covers the earth. But the glory of the Lord rises upon you. And Jesus was the light of God. The Bible says that in, um, it says in Galilee, those who dwelt in darkness, a light is born. And so Jesus then became the light of the world. And this idea of light and of glory are what goes together. So we need to realize then, in closing, that the people who don't see the gospel are in darkness. The ones that hate unforgiveness, bitterness, uh, hatred, all those things are signs of people living in darkness. But God has called us to live in light and live for His glory. So in closing, let's go to Matthew 5 verse 16. Once again, a well-known verse. I'm going to close here. Matthew 5 verse 16. This is our assignment as we leave here today. Matthew 5, verse 16. Well, let's start from verse 14 for context. Okay? Matthew 5, verse 14. He says, You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be lit, cannot be hidden. Verse 15, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Verse 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Church, this is our assignment as we leave here today. Dense darkness covers the earth. Dense darkness covers the people. You're going to work this week, you're going to work, you will find that there are people that are living in darkness, trying to sabotage what you're doing, trying to pull you down, trying to get promotion at your expense. You're going to find all those, those difficult people in darkness. The temptation will be for us to hate them, to retaliate, to also be bitter, to, to fight fire with fire. But Jesus says, no, we need to be the light of the world. And we need to realize that we can now live for God's glory. And say, so, okay, God, in this situation, in this difficult position, how am I going to let my light shine and live for your glory?